we thank you for your gift and the work, Lord. It is such a beautiful thing to get to know you and to understand you and to see your face through it, Lord. I pray that in our lesson today that we will continue with that, seek your love and your will, and put our faith in it and you, Lord. And help us to understand and to consume it and have it guide our lives, Lord. And we ask this in your Son's name. Amen. 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 So we're going to continue with the nine marks of a healthy church. And today we're going to start the third mark, which is the gospel. Um, the book that uh, we are using is the third edition, and I found out that there's a fourth edition. And I just wanted to bring that up because there are some differences in that book versus the third. So if you, if you guys have went out and bought the book and you're studying and it's the fourth edition, there may be some differences in the layout and how it proceeds. So, we're on the third mark, which is the gospel, and it's really a big concern that Deborah's trying to present to us here, because uh, we can get it wrong, and he's trying to bring these possibilities to light here, because, well, if you ever watched anything online or on the TV, you can see where a lot of it is being conveyed incorrectly or wrong, missing pieces mostly. And Mark wants to make sure that that's not happening because a healthy church will present the whole gospel, every bit of it. Mm -hmm. And that's important. So our first lesson is going to be about the five points that Mark Evers has put in the book for the third Mark, the gospel. I wanted to use uh, those five points to make sure that uh, I get all of Mark Evers' points across during the lesson. And today... We are going to go over the first three, if we have time. Depends on how much interaction you guys give me, and hopefully it's a lot. Which means we may only get through two, but it's not a, a race or anything, so we'll do what we can. So I'm going to read the, first, the five marks so you know what they are. So the first mark, or I say the mark, the, the first point in the third mark. The good news is not simply that we are okay. The good news is not simply that God is love. The good news is not simply that Jesus wants to be our friend. The good news is not simply that God will renew creation. And the final point is a, a review and a response. The good news and our response. And that's going to be about repentance and belief. So we're going to try to go over the first three. And if we have, since it's broken up into an uneven number, I, I chose to try to get through a decent amount of it today with the hopes of next week having a little bit more discussion time at the end. But that depends on how much discussion that we do today. So you know, if it pushes into a third week, it's possible, or it might not. So it's not set in stone. But that's my goal. Two weeks, we'll do the first, the first of the three points today. Now, the first one is, the good news is not simply that we are okay. And that's where a lot of churches and Mark's main concern comes from, is that people leave, leave out just how needy we are of the gospel and how important it is. So, Mark never wrote... The Bible utterly rejects the idea that we are okay, that the human condition is just fine, that everyone is really in need of simply accepting their condition, their finitude, their limitedness, and their imperfections, or that we simply need to look on the brighter side of things. He also wrote, the laws of God are not simply external statutes published and passed by some Congress in heaven. Rather, the laws of God reflect His very character. They are an expression of God Himself. So to break any of God's laws is to give or live against God. It is to live contrary to Him. And we do. We, we definitely live contrary to God. In Romans 3.23, Paul wrote... For all have sinned 
and fall short of the glory of God. Paul wasn't being lighthearted when he wrote that. We need to consider the consequences of sin and of falling short of the glory of God. Without Christ, we are in uh, serious trouble. James 2.10 Whoever keeps the whole law yet stumbles at just one point is guilty of breaking all of it. So what are the consequences of sin? So feel free to step in there. Yeah, it's interesting. Like, you know, we're covering Romans uh, last Sunday, for example. Uh, it, since uh, you sense the slave of sin, right? So first it's slavery. Then it's an increase in the sin because it, it overmasters you continually and increasingly. And then finally, when, when sin is full, we're going to bring forth death uh, as it's just and due wages. So the, the sin becomes part of its own judgment in a way because you're bound more and more to it. And then ultimately it kills him. Yes, that's very good. And God also will lend us to it and let it, let it have its way. And Romans six twenty three tells us that the way of Jesus is sin is death. Yes. But the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ. So are we talking about a physical death or what 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 is death there? Separation from God. Yes. That's a that's a key thing. And Unbelievers, the people who aren't, you know, studied in the Bible, are they're not going to understand that. They're not even going to know that. So uh, Mark's big concern is going to be that we convey that, that important information. So God is holy. Holy in Greek is hagios. Hagios means set apart by or for God, holy or sacred. We are not, we are called to be holy. But how is God holy? What, what are we talking about here? Set apart, totally different than us. Mm -hmm. That's true. Mm -hmm. We are we what? We are made in God's image. God's totally separated from us. Yes. God is, so even if we were not in the picture, God is still holy. He is still set apart himself. He set himself apart. Perfect and sinless. Exactly. He set himself apart from sin. So in our sin, we have separated ourselves from God because he is holy. John 14, 6, Jesus said, I am the way and the truth and the life. He proclaims himself as life. So God is life. And being separated from God, we have severed ourselves from life. So we're not okay in our sin. Without Christ, we are not okay. In the gospel, the good news is truly amazing news. <clears throat> and without the understanding of why the gospel is the good news, its power begins to fade. And if a sinner does not see just how bad their situation is, how will they receive the good news? <clears throat> Deborah sets the third mark of a healthy church as the gospel because if we're getting this wrong, <coughs> we're not a healthy church. <clears throat> and his concern is of getting it wrong falls on the belief that we are okay. And that's what the average unbeliever is going to think of themselves. That's the reason why they're not interested and don't care about church. They don't care about God because they believe that they are okay. So if we act like we believe we're okay, then there's going to be problems. We need to understand the gospel and we need to react to it as if we understand it and help others to come to that same understanding. Churches all over the U.S. and the world, they teach that we're all okay. I'm sure you've all heard some of those wealth, health, and 
prosperity churches preach. And they, they leave out the hard parts. And they, they, they pull in the sugary parts, the sweet parts that everybody wants to hear. Through Christ we are redeemed, but to leave out why we are needing redeeming, but sharing the gospel is a grave mistake. All have sinned. All have fallen short of the glory of God. Never wrote, true Christianity is realistic about the dark side of our world, our life, our nature, our hearts. But the news that Christians have to bring is not just that our depravity is so pervasive, but that God's plans for us are so wonderful. Because He knows what He made us for. And I find that to be a very powerful statement. It, it's easy to get hung up on our sin and to lose sight of what God has planned for us and what He created us to be like and for. If we get hung up on our sin and stay broken in it, then we don't dwell in that place. We don't dwell in that beautiful image that God has. He, our creation is for a purpose. The contrast between our broken nature and the gift from God must be made clear. Isn't the gospel absolutely great news? The good news is wonderful. And a lot of Christians, they, they don't live out that, that attitude that the gospel is wonderful. We are to think on the positive things and the happy things and the fact that we have been redeemed. Our sin is no more. Our debt is paid. We need to dwell in that mindset. We need to know that and believe that. And people need to see that we believe that. And when sharing the gospel, that should be part of it. So. That's it for the first point. Do you have any questions? Are we okay? <laughs> no. <clears throat> the good news is not simply that God is love. Now, this one's dangerous too. And it gets abused a lot. I know televangelists and and now the YouTube evangelists, I don't know what, if that's even a term, but it is now. There, there, there's a lot of those that are getting this one wrong. And a lot of people's, you know, a lot of un, unknowledgeable Christians, they believe in this. This is their motto. This is their entire philosophy and their, their faith. And they leave out important pieces. Mark... Deborah is concerned about that. Deborah writes, Often we hear the gospel presented as the message that God is love. This is like the headline in the Stillwater, Oklahoma news press. Cold weather causes temperatures to drop. Well, that may be news in Oklahoma, but upon reading such a statement, one wonders if something has been left out. The Bible does say that God is love in John 1, 4, 8. But is that the whole story? Now, some of us are blessed with children. And we've had them ask for things and want things. And we've had to say no. And they would rebuttal with, but if you love me. <laughs> and... We know as adults and understand that, yeah, if I love you, you're going to get the same no because you're getting it because I love you. And pushing that whole idea that God is just love, that he is, he is simply love, causes problems there because it, it creates a misunderstanding. And it is no different from your own children, my child, my kids, my grandkids. 
you know, they don't understand no. Of course, my, my two girls are adults now and they're, they're learning. And I have one that has gifted me with a grandchild and she's really learning now because she's getting to say no. And he's at that age now where sometimes that's not a happy thing for him. So he'll fuss. But, you know, we're, we're, we are like that with God. Sometimes he says no, and it's not happy, it's pain. And the world can't be, you know, thinking that God is simply love because in those situations they'll misunderstand and they'll run and retreat from God. So it's a problem. God also disciplines because he, he loves us. And to sum up the gospel as God is love is dangerous. It sets unrealistic expectations for those who simply don't understand love or God. Now, what is the main issue with this twisted view of the gospel? What kind of problem is that creating? It leaves out just justice and judgment. Yes. There's a whole element whole to God that because He's righteous, because of your sins, there has to be judgments and justice. How does that tie into our salvation? Jesus is a bridge. Um, to be saved, we are required to believe in Christ. And there's another element. We're to repent. Mm -hmm. So that that whole God is love kind of leaves that out and breaks that. That could be dangerous. That could cause issues with salvation. I think the main problem was with the definition of love. Yes. Um, so people think that God loves them, so it's going to make everything easy and good, and that that's the wrong definition of love. His righteousness and his justice and the requirement of payment for sin that all comes out of God's love. Because how is loving God not just or righteous? So. That's where my brain went. It, it creates a false expectation that God is just going to do whatever you want okay, and, 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 make, and make your life exactly how you want it to be and just give you all the things you need or want. It's like they think God is love means he's a very God father up in the sky and everything is magical and giving us all our wishes. And that's not even really what love is. No, oh, yeah, you're right. That's a small definition. Um, my, my kids asked me recently uh, about wrath and, and they heard something like, oh, God, God's wrath. And, and, I, and they were like, oh, God, God is not wrath. And I said, yes, he does. And they were like, then I had to explain what that means. And I said, well, let me explain. If somebody really hurts you really badly, and God was just like, that's okay, and they don't get any kind of consequence for hurting his child, would that be love? That's not really love. So his judgment and, and all is his love. It's part of our justification. It's realigning us to the correct <laughs> behavior, the correct heart. You're absolutely right. And, and he's, a, he's also a teacher. Yes, he is. And I agree with that. I, I, that's a very good point. I mean, that comes up, that comes into my mind with the curse of childbearing. Mm -hmm. And I know, you know, you ladies get the brunt of that one. And there's a great deal of physical pain and effort and labor. But then as a parent, we get to we get to witness what we did to him. Mm -hmm. We'll bear something beautiful and perfect in our eyes to the end of the world, and it will grow, and then it will defy us. Because that's our nature. We're born with that. Since we sinned in the beginning, and it's now passed on like a disease, our children are born with it. And in that, they will hurt us. It's not forever. It's not permanent, but it, it is painful sometimes. And God wants us to, to witness that. He wants us to understand what we did to him. And childbearing is a great big part of that. And that's a lesson for us. That's a teaching moment. He wants us to 
understand what we did to him so that hopefully we would not do it and be against it and to see kids face him well. Yes. Yeah, I think when we say God is love, we look at that as a uh, blank card for forgiveness. That if God truly loves us, no matter what we do, we're going to be forgiven. And that, to some degree, is true. But that's based on the righteousness of Christ, not my own. Yes. And if we had to pick out one characteristic of God, you mentioned it before, being holy. In the book of Isaiah 6, it says, uh, Isaiah says, Hold the seraphim scream day and night, holy, holy, holy. I think that's the only place in Scripture where there's a three-tier description of God. Nowhere does it say God is love, love, love. Holy, holy, holy. Set apart. Yes. Justice, righteous. He wants us to be holy. Amen. And in that requires lessons. So he's going to teach us. And those lessons are going to be hard sometimes. Some of them are not going to be too hard. But in that, there's potential for us to grow away from him if we misunderstand it. And having a poor expectation of what love is, is is a big deal. It's a problem. And I think that our world's view of love, you know, the, the societal view of it is, you know, it's kind of a selfish definition, selfish thought or feeling. And we think it's all about feelings and we think about, you know, how we would want to be treated in a situation where we thought we were being loved. And I, I don't think that's there, there are definitely some good parts in some of that. It's true, but there's some bad parts. It's like, love isn't always just an emotion. I, I would actually question if it's an emotion at all. I would say love is more action than it is emotion. And if emotions get involved, well, those can change. And as humans and our brokenness, that definitely is going to change. It's going to twist and love loses its meaning and that's why we have such problems in our relationships. Yes. I, you know, uh, I've seen what God has shown me like in the Old Testament times when uh, God was displeased with his chosen people. He displayed, he always displayed his love. He gave a warning that first is displaying love. And, um, gave him a way out. And he shown his love. And a lot of times they did not listen. And that's where when people say it's wrath, I look at it differently now. I think it's his justice. You know, everybody wants justice in this world. And but with God everything's okay. You can do whatever you want with God and it's okay because he's love. I think we're so blessed by the, what God shows us in the Old Testament. How he reveals himself so greatly that even when, say, his anger comes upon us, he says, come to me. He said, how many times to show his people? That was what you just said. When he says, come to me, he's actually saying, repent. Yes. That's what he's saying. Yes. And I will forgive you and show my love to you. It's, it, I just praise God for everything He shows us in the Old Testament. It, for any one of us to be a Christian and not read the Old Testament, we really, we really miss out on so much. Big time. No, I would agree with that. There's, it's, I don't think it's, it's really good practice or really possible to understand God at all without the Old Testament. Yeah. It is key. It is crucial. The entire Bible is the entire Bible. You can't just pick it apart. Yeah. And the Old Testament is a huge element. You're right. There, we, as Christians as a whole, underestimate the value of the Old Testament. Look at the book of Revelation. Oh my God. I had people that, you know, I, I really don't know where their heart is with the Lord. I'm scared of that book. I don't want to read it. But when you read Revelations, it's not everything you see so much love of God in the book of Revelations and mercy. It's it's amazing. But yet there's justice, you know. So repentance 
Without it, we have no salvation. And in that sense, that's the same problem with we're okay. We're not okay. And if we believe that, we'll never repent. We'll never be broken of our sin, and it's never going to change our, our thinking or our actions. And that's why God is love is dangerous. Yes, sir? Yeah, I think um, God is love without Christ is dangerous. Because there's, you know, we're born into wickedness. We're all fallen creatures, Romans 3, 23. And the wrath of God is a, is a major thing. And yes, God does pour out his common grace, if you will. You know, he, everything we have is good. It's by his, his gracious sovereign will. He is, he is kind to all. However, we stand condemned apart from Christ. And you have to talk about our fallen nature. I think we as a church sometimes get we sometimes get inoculated or maybe um, jaded. Yeah, I mean cold-hearted because uh, we need to, you know, there's people all around us that don't know Christ. And they don't realize that they're heading straight to hell. And sometimes we can just get so indifferent about that. And we we need to think about the wrath of God. We're not under the wrath of God if we have Christ. And we do. You know, that's the good news of the gospel. But other people, you know, who don't have Christ, we I mean, Satan would love us to, he would love the world to have the mindset that God loves you. Oh, God loves you. You know, you are... But that's a lie. I mean, it's a lie in the sense that if you don't have Christ, if there's any other way besides Jesus Christ to get the reconciled to God, then Christ died needlessly. We know that's not true. And we know that's not true. But the church can get inoculated, indifferent. Yeah. You know, they get become numb. God's going to love that person somehow. Lazy. That's a good word. Yes. Yes. Uh, I think one of the problems with that God loves you is that if, if you're saying that apart from follow, the following of the Ten Commandments, it's void of salvation. Uh, to you because he says, repent and be baptized. Repent of what? I've had people tell me that the, and people, some people don't even know that they're sinning. You know, until you bring forth the, the, the Bible and you bring forth the Old, the Old Testament, you bring forth the Ten Commandments, how do you know that you're a sinner? That's true. That is exactly true. I mean, without the Bible and without study, we're not going to know what God wants. We're not going to know what His will is. And we're not going to understand God. Because God is the Word. And what He's given to us in the Word is Himself. Mm. And without knowing it, we're not going to know anything. We're, we're going to be happy in our little world of there is no God, or He doesn't matter. Uh, what, what do you repent of if you don't know right and wrong? Right. So Mark's concern with God is love is our own understanding of who and what God is. And anyone who has read the Old Testament knows that God is dangerous. Mm. Mm. And God is not to be tested or messed with. God <coughs> is our only righteous <coughs> judge. But in those things, he shows us love. And that's sort of what you were getting to there, Jeff. You know, there is love there. God is love, but that's not all he is. And to be hung up on that is, is a dangerous, dangerous mindset. Deborah writes, It is only as we thus contemplate the greatness of God that we begin to realize that his love has a depth, a texture, a fullness, and a beauty that we in our present state can only wonder at. The gospel is not simply that God is love. Our uh, personal testimonies probably reflect some pain. And the fact that we have a testimony proves that God loved us in that moment. And it was painful. Now, I'm not saying everybody's testimony includes some kind of pain like that. Some people are you know, gifted with an aha moment, if you will. 
to follow God that didn't include a lot of pain. Some, some included some pain that we will never understand. But that pain was love in that instance. And our minds don't want to compute that, you know, as a nation or a world. We leave that out. Just like our kids leave that out. They don't understand that we love them by saying no. And in that moment, they feel some type of pain. They, they may feel rejected by their own parent because the parent didn't want to give them what they wanted. But in that moment of pain, we love them. We understand things they don't, just like God understands things that we don't. And sometimes we have to endure. <coughs> the good news is not simply that Jesus wants to be our friend. And that's another one. So I, I love these, these points that Mark has pointed out in this part of the, in this book, or in this chapter, the gospel. He, it's almost like he's picking apart the uh, health, wealth, and prosperity churches and the preachers and the, those ministries. Deborah writes, sometimes people present the gospel simply as Jesus wants to be our friend or that he wants to be our example. But the Christian gospel is not a matter of merely cultivating a relationship or following an example. We all have a real past to deal with, real sin that we have committed, real guilt that we have incurred. So what is to be done? What will our holy God do? If he wants us to come to know him, how can he make that happen without sacrificing his own holiness? Does he simply let us know that our sin against him is no big deal? That he's just going to forgive and forget? Jesus came to this earth to die. Jesus said, The Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. And that's in Mark 10, 45. All four Gospels center on Christ's death on the cross. All four. That's their primary content. That's the, that's the goal to get that across. Christ came to die. Mm -hmm. So what does all this have to do with being enslaved to sin? He came to redeem us. Yes. He's our redeemer to set us free from our sin through the payment of a ransom, which is his love. Yes. Yeah, that's what I was going to say. Yes. So... All four Gospels center on freeing us from an incredible debt. Something we will never be able to pay without Him. Yeah, for God so loved the world that He gave His only Son. Yeah, talking about that last bullet point there, you know, God is, God is love. He is love in that instance. That is, that is the primary message. He loved us so much that He gave us something that we, could, we couldn't acquire. There's nothing that we could do to acquire that. He had to give it to us. And His Son, unlike we, is perfect, sinless, completely innocent, without any guilt. And He gifted Him to us. And Christ died for us. Because as we already discussed, the penalty of sin is death. When it comes to its full fruition, we are to die apart from Christ. So through Christ, He paid that debt. And we are no longer under that, that debt, that penalty. Deborah wrote, How could something so horrifying be at the center of something called the good news? Because the cross... It's God's way to bring us back to Himself. So, Endeavor starts to use some different languages here and how this relates, how this ties together. And there's four or five different, so let's say, yeah, four different uh, vernaculars, if you will. Economically, Christ shed His own blood to purchase us out of slavery. Just like the Israelites were freed from slavery to Egypt, we have been freed of our slavery to sin. 
Relationally, our fellowship with God has been restored by Christ's death on a cross. Our sin has been dealt with. A debt has been paid. And thus the price for our sin is gone. We have been restored to God. And legally, Christ has intervened on our behalf. And our guilty verdict for our sin has been fully cleared. We are now justified to God. And the penalty of death has been transferred to Christ. Jesus has paid our penalty in full. Militarily, Christ has disarmed the powers and the authorities that dwell on the spiritual battlefield. He took their power. Thankfully. When Deborah wrote, in the New Testament, none of this language refers to something that is merely potential or optional. Rather, it refers to God actually having accomplished His end and His purpose through Christ's death. So it's not a matter of question there. It, it's been completed. Christ said, it is finished. And that's a beautiful part of, of the Gospel. But Christ's death is proof that he didn't come just to be a friend or just to be an example. Those are all important things, but it's not the only part of the gospel. It's not Christ's only or the most important parts of his ministry. His death is at the center of that. Something that most people would find ugly. But after study and understanding, we realize it's love. It's beautiful. It's not horrifying. It's beautiful. It's something that, yes, sir. Well, I was just saying, it's, it's just something that should bring great joy. It's not like, you know, Christ's death it should be something we mourn. You know, we mourn all other deaths, right? Go ahead. Um, if you're going to cover this next week, we'll cover this next week. My, my question is is there evidence within um, a local body, a local church? that we have forgotten the centrality of the gospel message. What does, it, what does a church look like when it forgets that? Because you talked about the health and wealth and prosperity gospels, and we can kind of see that almost immediately. There are other subtleties that a, a Bible teaching church has lost its way in a sense and, and what do we do in order to prevent that from happening, right? So there, there have been very good, doctrinally sound churches in the past that have lost their way. And these churches now are really not gospel-centric churches. And so I'm wondering if, if we're going to have that discussion, I'd like to think that through. What is it that we... Is, is it possible for that to happen now? I would agree. That's a good question. I mean, that should be our primary concern, especially in this church, because I believe that, for the most part, we're fairly healthy, but I could be blind to something there. And I think we should ask these questions against our own church here. And that's part of why we're doing this study. I think it has a lot to do with the elders, too, keeping everything in line. Make sure you have good elders in there. Well, the top end needs to be... You know, they have to watch out for each other. The people have to watch the elders. Accountability the within the church is important. Yes. Yeah. And yes. Today's culture is messing with everything, I, so yeah. I think there is a real danger in the local church if the focus is no longer um, Christ and he being the way, the truth, and the life. In other words, mm -hmm. he who knew no sin to take my sin so that I would receive the righteousness of God in Him. When we lose that focus and we become more into pleasing people mm -hmm. and tickling their ears and making that the focus of, hey, this is a nice place, we have a nice fellowship. Um, the church appealing to the average person who comes in off the street and 
shielding them against the difficult truth sometimes, you know, or maybe watering down from the pulpit. We're sinners. We're, we stand condemned before a holy God. And if we soften that wrath of God, you soften the need for a Savior. Amen. And you start, appealing, you start appealing more toward what the listener wants to hear. That's right. And that could be a dangerous thing. It's almost mm -hmm. like we live in a culture where people pick churches like they pick gymnasiums. Mm -hmm. you know, I agree, yeah. Kind of fitness. That tickling of the ear part is warned in the Bible, so we know it's very important to be concerned about it. When you start losing the focus, I just yeah. want to finish. When you start losing the focus on the gospel that you're, that you're pointing to right now, and start focusing more on being inviting. Yes. I think that's a danger. Yeah. Yes. Hundred percent. Yep. Drew. Yep. Yeah. Yep. Yep. It's interesting when you ask that question. My mind goes to First um, John four, and then Revelation two, and it's interesting because you know First John four obviously being the passage where he says God is love, but that's in the context of testing the spirits and, 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 and identifying those who are in Christ from those who aren't. Um, and the, the reason he even makes that point of passing is because he says love is of God and if we're of God we love like him. And he's encouraging the church to love one another by reference to the gospel as, as, as you know, the gospel empowers, right? The gospel shows us what God's love looks like and then we would expect to see that poured out between and among the church, and then again in Revelation two, when he, when Jesus is addressing the church in Ephesus, the, the strike against them is not doctrinal purity. They 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 hate what is evil. They have solid doctrine and sound doctrine, but they have lost the first works of love for God and love for one another. Um, and so, if you're looking for a diagnostic tool. You, you would look to whether you know, the church, there's evidence between and among the members of the body of the kind of sacrificial love, expecting nothing in return, and no reciprocation um, that, that Christ poured out for his church. Mm. Um, but that's, that's the litmus test that he gives. Is, 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 is the love of God active between and among the body? Roger, did you? Sorry. Yeah, just I think when the church emphasizes that grace is free, which it is, but it's never cheap. Mm -hmm. Jesus That's himself says, count the cost. There's, there's a cost involved here. We speak of God's love being unconditional, but it's very conditional. It's conditional on the blood of Christ. Yes. When we lose sight of that, I think then we begin to teach a cheap grace. A grace that says, we went to a church in the area not long ago, maybe a year or so ago, to see a relative baptized. There were probably seven or eight people being baptized that day. And the pastor asked this question, have you asked Jesus into your heart? And I had to ask myself, what does that mean? Yeah. <laughs> what does that mean? Yeah. Does that mean am I going to follow Christ? Am I committed to Christ? Do I recognize myself as a sinner who is beyond hope? Yeah. Whose only hope is Christ? Yes. You know, what does that mean that? to ask Jesus into your heart. I think when we cheapen the gospel, yeah. we make yeah. a big mistake. Mark does actually use an example there where a visitor comes to a church mm -hmm. and they leave there not knowing any more than they came with mm -hmm. because that church was not presenting the gospel. And he goes to say that every sermon should present the gospel. That's his idea of how to combat that, to recenter on the gospel every time and to present it in every situation. If you're in the Old Testament, mm -hmm. you should show how that goes back to the gospel. Mm -hmm. Because it, it will. Uh, all of it does. As I've been taught here. And as I've studied in my own studies. Matthew? <clears throat> I think, you know, that asked me, like, what are some visible signs like that the church has lost the focus of the gospel as a central core? And I think one of the ways that it manifests itself is everybody's okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Right? Mm -hmm. How you doing? I'm good. They struggle. That's true. You struggle with it? Nah. No, I'm good. And then you see that manifest itself in prayer. Yeah. So, 
Can I pray for you? Yeah, my knee is kind of hurting. Uh, I got this job thing going on. You got any sin in your life you can pray for? No, that's, you know, I got... You, you see where, where, where it takes us to temporal, physical things, because we're all okay. We, we've lost out the gospel. We don't realize that we need the gospel every day. Yeah. Right? We don't, need, we don't realize that the gospel wasn't just one point in our lives that brought about salvation. Right. The gospel is a daily thing that we live out. And if it is a daily thing that we live out, then it's going to be exposing sin daily, because we're not going to be perfect. And if it's exposing sin daily, we're going to be more vulnerable when we're going to the struggle. <coughs> prayers are going to change, right? We're going to be like, open and honest, we're going to be like, yeah, actually, I'm really struggling. Like, you know, this week was brutal. I was struggling with this in my life. I had so much pride towards my family. I was acting, acting obnoxious. And I, I don't know how to get out of this. Right? And now, now it's like, oh, well, let's, let's pray for that. Let's work with that. Like, you need the gospel. You need to be reminded that Jesus died for you. And I think when you lose the center of the gospel, you lose that element of the church. You lose that realness, and everything becomes a little bit more superficial. And you see that in your prayers, you see that in the conversations. And it's subtle because it, on the surface it looks, it still looks right. Right? You're still like in the word and everything looks right. But something's missing. Yep. Just like the Pharisees. Yeah. Mm -hmm. They were checking out all the boxes. Mm -hmm. Christ saw right through them. Mm -hmm. Their heart was broken. Yeah. Kind of and we could fall into that easily without the gospel. We're, if we think we're good to go, then yep. when we arrive, we have no need for the gospel. So we have to, we really have to concentrate on that price, that cost. Mm -hmm. And and what kind of value did Christ bring with his death? He brought a value that we really don't even understand right now. There's no way. We won't until we're in his presence. Mm -hmm. And we might not even fully understand it. Yeah. I think it's what, what is missing from a lot of churches that may have gone astray is um, discipleship um, and, yeah. and true discipleship and, and teaching discipleship, like what that is. Not yeah. just like, I believe in Jesus, I'm just going to go about my life now. Right. I just believe in him. Well, the demons believed in Jesus too. That's right. They believed in Jesus and they're not, you know, going to heaven. Uh, it doesn't mean anything. To say right. that you believe in Jesus, you follow him. Do you, what does that look like? Let's talk mm -hmm. about it. Being vulnerable and having a safe place to be vulnerable to where, you know, if I say, hey, I'm really struggling with something, that doesn't make everybody in the room feel super uncomfortable. Right. You know, and they can guide me in love and accountability. And, you know, it, it takes a lot of trust um, in the church to be able to, to do that. It takes a lot of trust to, you know, me saying, hey, I'm really. I'm struggling with this, and I truly want people to walk with me. Um, you know, and having that person take that trust and, and hold it well, and not just, you know, let me talk about what she told me. Right. That's why gossip is a, a bad thing. It's, it will break relationship and flat her. It's dangerous. And you're right, that trust is key to that. And it goes back to what Matt's saying about being real and admitting that we have a very serious problem. And even with Christ, we still need help with it. And we need to recenter on the gospel frequently, all the time, as often as we can stand it. Now, when you feel yourself to be utterly unworthy, you have hit the truth. Charles Spurgeon. So I'm going to close this in prayer and we'll run out of time. Dear Lord. We thank you for this good news that you've given us, Lord. And I pray that we don't undervalue what you've given us, Lord. I pray that we don't underestimate it. I pray that we live our lives as if this is the most wonderful news ever. And I pray that everybody that we are exposed to, everybody in the public, everywhere we go, may have the chance of seeing that, just how beautiful the good news is to us. And I pray that you'll give us opportunities just to, to do just that, Lord. And I pray that we will stay focused on Christ's death and understand the payment that was paid there and how valuable it really is. And we thank you for all that you've provided through Christ. We, we thank you for seeking us and providing a way out of our sin and to take us from slavery. 
And we ask these things in your son's name. Amen.